March Madness provides so much excitement every year, but nothing moves the needle in the state of Texas like football. And today, your favorite football team starts spring practice. You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we are discussing spring practices, right? 12 questions that can be answered through spring practices ahead of our inaugural season in the SEC for the Texas Longhorns. First segment, four questions. Second segment, four questions. Third segment, you guessed it, four questions. Once again, that can be answered throughout spring practices for this Texas football team. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So as far as these episodes of Locked On Longhorns on audio, they do pretty consistently. Most of the time they go by downloads, not listens. But still, regardless of what I'm talking about, they do pretty consistently on audio. Um, and this is an audio podcast that you just watch me record on YouTube. So shout out, you know, shout out to uh, my audio audience for real. You know, they've been the backbone of you know my success the last three years. Um, and in terms of YouTube, right, there is a clear difference between how videos about basketball and baseball will do compared to football, which I get right. Like football is what moves the needle. Football is what sells. It's the state of Texas. Right. It's the University of Texas, the 40 acres. Right. Um and so because of that, I had some housekeeping notes yesterday that I said on the show that I'm going to repeat today. Right. Just because I expect a larger audience talking about spring practice compared to the Texas men's basketball team getting a seven seed in the NCAA tournament. So if you haven't seen me in a while, maybe you're not tapped in. The algorithm can do that. Right. So make sure you're subscribed, liking and, you know, catching these posts. They're somewhat daily. Right. <laughs> Heavy on the somewhat. And two, um, if you have not seen me, like I said, maybe you're not tapped in, but I also was on vacation in Nashville slash Atlanta getting much needed R&R. So I'm back now and ready to cover um, March Madness and spring football at a high level for the third straight year. Also, uh, if I look different, right, it's because I do not have my headphones on prior to yesterday, I had done every episode, I believe, of Locked on Longhorns with my black beats on. Right. And now this is the current status of my black beats. Thank to, thanks to the TSA agent and the Atlanta airport. So remind me to never fly through Atlanta again. But seriously, if I look different, this is why, right? Over 300 episodes with these bad boys, and now I can't use them. I do have an active claim against TSA. We'll see what happens. But trust me, I feel naked, right? Like, I look weird. <laughs> I feel weird looking at myself with no headphones on. And I, I think I've said it on a podcast before. I don't even use the headphones. Like, I don't have them. I use. I just, it's like the aesthetic. Like, it just makes me feel better. It makes me feel more comfortable, so. Hopefully I get some new ones soon. Right. Today's episode, 12 questions that can be answered through spring practices. Uh, you know, the off season always feels so long. Um, but you know, it always moves fast, right? Like I think just time just moves so fast, period. Especially because, yeah, time just moves super fast, right? And it's like it feels like I wouldn't say yesterday, but it doesn't feel like Michigan won the national championship two months ago, right? Like it's already been two months since they won a national championship. And today the Texas Longhorns start spring practices. And before you know it, it'll be fall camp. But before you know it, it'll be August 31st. And we'll be playing against Colorado State, right? In our first season in the SEC. So with them starting spring practices today, three practices a week to get to 15 practices. Um, and then the orange and white game on April 20th. Uh, I have, I believe, you know, uh, 12 questions that I think need to be answered prior to the start of the season um, because championship foundations are built in the offseason, right? Texas was a championship team last year in the Big 12 because of what they did in the offseason, starting with winter conditioning, right? And if this Texas football team in 2024 wants to be a championship team, that foundation started with winter conditioning, and now it will continue to fortify through spring practices and ultimately summer workouts and then fall camp ahead of the season. So, once again, first segment, four questions, second segment, four questions, third segment. You got it. All right. First question I want to ask slash provide analysis on, maybe even answer myself is who is your number one wide receiver? All right. I think Quinn Ewers came into a situation the last two years where he knew that Xavier Worthy was his number one wide receiver. I think Steve Sarkeesian came into a situation the last two years where he knew that the majority of his passing plays would be dialed up to get Xavier Worthy involved. Right now with Xavier Worthy moving on to the National Football League. 
both of them are in a completely different situation. I would say more so Quinn Ewers than Steve Sarkeesian. And we would all expect that Isaiah Bond is going to be our new number one wide receiver. I've said on the podcast that uh, Xavier were these career highs in a season of 75 catches and 1,014 yards will be surpassed this year by Isaiah Bond. But of course, he probably would have to be the number one wide receiver uh, to do that. And I think that we can assume that Isaiah Bond will be the number one, especially because of the similarities he has uh, frame wise and speed wise uh, to Xavier Worthy. But you still have to go out there and compete. Right. It's about who has the best spring and offseason moving forward. It's about who Quinn Ewers builds the most rapport with. And it's about who Steve Sarkeesian feels the most comfortable comfortable with dialing up plays right who does he feel the most comfortable with going to in most situations in the passing game like i said for the last three years that was xavier worthy but it cannot be xavier worthy this year because he is moving on to the national football league but i don't think we can assume it'll be isaiah bond because the wide receiver room is very talented and once again it comes down to who plays the best in the spring who performs the best in the offseason who steve sarkeesian feels the most comfortable with and who quinn ewers builds the best rapport with we think that will be isaiah bond it likely will be isaiah bond but that remains to be seen what is your wide receiver rotation? That is the second question I believe needs to be answered. You know, we've seen in the past, Sark at the University of Texas has not had the ability or has not yet been able to use more than three wide receivers in a significant role in one season. And coming from Alabama, where we saw, you know, Sark being able to use Waddle and Smith and Ruggs and Judy at the same time, we've clamored for Steve Sarkeesian to be able to use four wide receivers at a high level in this Texas offense. So that's something we've been looking for for the last three seasons. And there have been times where Texas didn't have four receivers that, you know, maybe we necessarily could trust. But I don't think that that's the case this year. Right. I think that Isaiah Bond is going to be a huge part of this wide receiver rotation. Uh, Matthew Golden, obviously, is going to be a huge part of this wide receiver rotation. Jonte Cook, a top 45 recruit um, who was our fourth wide receiver last year, should have a big role in this Texas offense this year at the wide receiver position. Silas Bolden is not on campus right now, but, you know, obviously he was brought over in the transfer portal for a reason and will be here in the summer. You know what? will his you know snaps this year what will uh you know his opportunity look like this year and then you have you know an all world five star in ryan wingo who's 6'2 210 and is getting up to speeds in you know winter conditioning of 22 miles per hour right how do you keep him off the field deandre moore ryan niblet parker livingstone right the list goes on and on so we just have so many talented receivers that i don't see a scenario in which steve sarkeesian wouldn't be able to use four wide receivers at a high level this season but it's just something we have not seen yet in the three years under Steve Sarkeesian. So I would like to see what is that wide receiver rotation going to be this year. We'd like to have an idea of that idea of that going into the season and how many wide receivers can we utilize effectively? We know Sark can do four. We've seen it at Alabama. We know Sark can do three. We've seen it at Texas. Hopefully we can get up into that four or five range this year because the wide receiver room is just too talented not to do so. In my opinion, the third question is what will the split look like at running back? I think, in the three years under Steve Sarkeesian, we've had a bona fide running back one and we've had a bona fide running back two. I do not believe that's the case anymore. Right. And I'll explain. In the first year, you had B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson. Love Roshan Johnson to death. He's not B. John Robinson. Right. And then you had Jonathan Brooks after that. Right. And then in the second year, same thing. B. John Robinson, Roshan Johnson, combination of Jonathan Brooks slash Keelan Robinson. Right. Last year. We all knew as a fan base that Jonathan Brooks was probably better than Cedric Baxter, but it took the staff two weeks into the season to figure that out. No harm, no foul, because Jonathan Brooks almost won the Doe Walker Award, not starting to the third game of the season. Um, but still, I think as it materialized, we realized that Jonathan Brooks was a definitive running back one. Cedric Baxter was running back two. And then you had whoever else that would get in and make plays, Jaden Blue, right, in this scenario. This year, I don't think you have a definitive running back one and running back two, right? I think you can make the argument that Cedric Baxter is better than Jaden Blue. I think you can make the argument that Jaden Blue is better than Cedric Baxter. Either way, there's no definitive running back one and running back two, in my opinion. And I don't believe that Steve Sarkeesian can allocate the touches to his running backs in the same way he has the last three years. Obviously, Bijan was going to get way more touches than Roshan, as he should. Obviously, Jonathan Brooks was going to get way more touches than Cedric Baxter, as he should. But there's no way you can tell me, based on what we've seen right now, that Cedric Baxter should get a significant amount, should get significant more significantly more touches than Jaden Blue. Sorry, I try to figure out how to say that on the fly. There's no way you can tell me, based on what we've seen, that Cedric Baxter should get a way higher 
amount of touches than Jaden Blue, right? I think it should be 1A, 1B, and they should touch the ball, the you know, pretty much the same amount. Now, if the season starts and Cedric Baxter goes crazy and Jaden Blue, you know, doesn't take that next step forward or, you know, he looks like a clear number two then to Cedric Baxter, then I think you adjust, uh, you know, the touches as you go along. But right now, based on what we've seen, I think we have two running backs that are on an equal level, and you can make the argument that Jaden Blue is better than Cedric Baxter at this point in their careers. And because of that, even though Cedric Baxter is a better fit in the offense, I think you have to think long and hard about how you allocate the touches because if Jaden Blue is better than Cedric Baxter, he should get more touches, period. Right? Like That's just how it should come down to, right? And I don't want to see a scenario in which we all know Jaden Blue is better, but Cedric Baxter is getting more touches for whatever reason, right? Emphasis on for whatever reason, right? The fourth question is, do you have enough in your defensive tackle room? Obviously, there's going to be a drop-off losing two All-Americans into Vondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, but it's the 40 Acres. It's the University of Texas. You have talented players in that position. Uh, Alfred Collins, Sadir Mitchell, Vernon Broughton, uh, you know, Dre Bledsoe, the list goes on and on. Are those players ready to step up and step into that role and perform at a high enough level for you to be a championship level team in the SEC and in college football? And if not, where do you pivot to? Right. You know, you do have the second transfer portal window that's opening after spring practices or at some point. Right. Do you dip back into the portal to get a defensive tackle? I think you need to evaluate what you have right now and make sure it's enough. And if it's not, I think you need to get back in that portal and see if you can just get something right. You know, obviously, there's never just amazing defensive tackles, <laughs> you know, in the portal or not too many of them. But I still think you need to evaluate what you have right now, evaluate if it's good enough to win a championship or be a high level football team in college football this year. And then if it's not, if you don't see that throughout the spring, I think you need to dip back in that portal to bring in some more competition in the defensive tackle room. A quick word from our sponsors and then four more questions that need to be answered by this Texas Longhorns football team throughout the spring. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Today's episode is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis fire tv offers amazing viewing experiences with smart tvs as well as the fire tv stick that you can plug into your existing tv that provides access to millions of movies and tv episodes as well as free and live tv whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament you're going to want to have a fire tv fire tv recently created fire tv channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free that includes all of us at locked on and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, Major League Baseball, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on. Fire TV. All right. The fifth question I want to see answered in spring practices by this Texas Longhorns football team is Hayden Connor at right tackle and Cole Hudson at left guard. What is best for the offensive line? Right. I think you have a scenario in which you can come into the season with your first four spots of the offensive line having a full year of consistency and continuity. Right. Kelvin Banks, Hayden Connor, Jake Majors and Devon Campbell, and then you just have to replace the right tackle, right? But I also can understand the staff, right? They see a hundred times more of these players in the football team that I do, then I can understand them saying that Hayden Connor might be a better option at right tackle, and then Cole Hudson might be a better option at left guard than leaving Hayden Connor at left guard and putting Cam Williams at right tackle. Also, you just brought in a five-star offensive tackle in Brandon Baker. How does he fit into this equation, right? Is he in consideration for that right tackle spot and then maybe keeping Hayden Connor at you know, left guard. Right. And then, you know, where do you put Cole Hudson? Right. Is he just a very valuable backup or is he your starting guard? So you can move, you know, Hayden Connor to right tackle. So, um, you know, 
I support, you know, whatever decision Kyle Flood makes and Steve Sarkeesian makes. Obviously, they've earned that benefit of the doubt. But, you know, I'm just asking, is that is what's best for the offensive line, right? Is moving Hayden Connor to right tackle instead of putting Cam Williams or Brandon Baker there your best option for the offensive line? Is Cole Hudson at left guard a better option than Hayden Connor, who has started there for multiple years now at that spot and has built continuity in between Kelvin Banks and Jake Majors? That stuff matters on the offensive line. So, once again, not saying that the – you know, preliminary decision, it seems like at this point to put Cole Hudson at left guard and uh, Hayden Connor at right tackle was a bad one. And obviously this still has to play out throughout the offseason. Right. Brandon Baker could take a jump. Cam Williams could take a jump that could change this entire equation. Right. But I'm just asking, is that the best option moving forward for this Texas offensive line? Of course, we will find out through the course of the offseason. And once again, I'm giving full benefit of the doubt to Kyle Flood and Steve Sarkeesian, because why wouldn't I? Number six, does Colin Simmons look elite? Right. I think we've all come to the conclusion that last year our safety room and our edge room, I wouldn't say our room, but the safety play and the edge play didn't necessarily move the needle for the Texas Longhorns and could have been a lot better, right? And I think this year you did a really good job of bringing in Trey Moore, who had 22 and a half sacks over the last two years, albeit, you know, in a little bit less competition at UTSA. And then on the other side, you know, you have Baron Sorrell and, and Ethan Burke, who are very – um good players at the edge position and I think can provide value to you, you know, on a game to game basis. But we talk about the three most important positions in football, the premium positions, it's going to be the quarterback, the edge rusher, right? Whose primary focus is to get, you know, the quarterback on the ground, especially in these past happy offenses in modern football. And then also um, the left tackle, because usually it's a right-handed quarterback who's pr protecting uh, the quarterback's blind side, right? Shout out to the right tackles that are protecting Tua and Dylan Gabriel, though. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to get them credit on the podcast as well. Um, so edge is a premium position, right? And because it's a premium position, you want players that move the needle at that position. When we went out and got Colin Simmons, it was because he was a needle mover, right? Like, I think Ethan Burke is a good player. I think Baron Sorrell is a good player. But I think Colin Simmons has the potential to be elite. Colin Simmons has the potential to be one of the best defensive players we have ever seen at the 40 Acres. And I'm not embellishing one bit, right? And he's already gotten up to a playable weight at 234 pounds is what he's listed on the Texas roster. So, does Colin Simmons look elite, right? Because he was billed coming into the University of Texas as an all-world prospect, right? And, you know, an edge prospect, you know, in the likes of a Will Anderson, a Dallas Turner, a Von Miller, uh, a Miles Garrett. You know, I don't want to put all of that on him, a Chase Young, but that's how he's been talked about as one of those types of guys, right? And I think if he is one of those types of guys, you'll see it right away. And if you see it right away, I think you have to make the tough decision to start him from game one or put him on the field from game one like you did with Anthony Hill, right? You know, like I said, this I didn't say this, but the Texas football program is at a period now where you got to throw the feelings out of the equation. You got to throw seniority out of the equation. You got to put the best players on the field. And if Colin Simmons is anything like he was at Duncanville at the University of Texas, if he shows you any, you know, I don't say anything, but if he shows you the Duncanville version of Colin Simmons this offseason at the University of Texas, then he needs to be a starter from day one. And you got, you know what I'm saying? And he should provide some high level. I'm talking about elite edge play for three years at the University of Texas. So like I said, I like Baron Surreal and I like Ethan Burke, but I think there's a ceiling to what they bring you. There is not a ceiling to what Colin Simmons can bring you. And if he shows any of that ceiling this offseason, then I think the best decision is to start him from day one and then have Ethan Burke and Baron Surreal as rotational pieces, regardless of how they feel about it, right? Like I said, Texas is just at that position now where you got to win games at the highest level. You can't do favors for anybody. And if Colin Simmons looks elite, he needs to be starting over Baron Surreal and Ethan Burke. Is Quinn Ewers taking the next step, right? Quinn Ewers obviously came back to college because he felt like there were things he could improve on to increase his draft stock and increase his earning potential going into the 2025 NFL draft. And as somebody who has watched, you know, Quinn Ewers pretty objectively over the last two years at the University of Texas, I think he's a really, really good quarterback. But if we're talking about taking that next step, and moving on to the National Football League, there are areas of improvement, obviously uh, being more consistent with the deep ball. I think being more consistent going through his progressions and going through his reads, right? Not locking on to um, his first receiver, consistently delivering the ball with accuracy, being able to navigate the pocket under pressure, being able to make throws under pressure, right? Being able to make tight window throws and not being able to just succeed when Steve Sarkeesian schemes these wide open receivers. So 
you know, <laughs> I mean, I know I just said a lot and it probably sounds like I'm getting on Quinn Ewers, but this, those are just all things on tape that can be cleaned up by Quinn Ewers if he wants to be one of the first quarterbacks taken in the 2025 NFL draft. But not just in terms of the NFL, right? I think Quinn Ewers progression this offseason will go a long way towards this football team having you know, the success they want to have and him being one of the best players in college football, regardless of position. So I do think Quinn Ewers can take the next step. I've outlined what he needs to do to take the next step. And the question will be, will we be seeing him take the next step and improving on some of those things I just mentioned throughout the offseason heading into the season this year and our first season in the SEC? And then the eighth question I have is, who are your second and third tight ends? I believe that Gunnar Helm will be your number one tight end this season. He's earned it, you know, playing next to or behind Jatavian Sanders the last couple of years. Obviously, you brought in, you brought in uh, Amari Nyblack from the University of Alabama, who's very explosive, right? Averaged, I believe, I don't have my notes in front of me, but almost 20 yards per reception last year. So he's super explosive. Um, and so he's probably your second tight end, right? But then who's your third tight end? And if he's if Amari Noblex not your second tight end, then who would be your second tight end, right? Is it John? No, not John. Juan Davis, right? Is it uh, Spencer Shannon? Is it Will Randall? Is it going to be one of the true freshmen? We don't know, right? And so it looks like you know Gunnar Helm and Amari Noblex are probably going to be your top two tight ends. You know, Steve Sarkis has repeatedly said that tight end is the second most important position in his offense. So that's why I treat tight end, you know, very you know as a very important position on this podcast because I know how we utilize it right and how much we like to get into that 12 personnel so is Gunnar Helm and Amari Nyblack your best two options at tight end it would seem that way going into the offseason but that's why we have the offseason to determine who are your two best options at tight end I think we need to know that by the time the season starts we will but I just don't know if that's a guarantee that it'll be Gunnar Helm and Amari Nyblack a quick word from our sponsors and we end the show with the last four questions I want to see answered this offseason particularly in spring practices I just realized that I did the wrong graphic and I spent the whole time trying to get back to it. Right? <laughs> All right. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nissan. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. How about not these guys? How about these women? These women from the Texas Longhorns women's basketball team who remained a top five team in the country this year with the loss of Rory Harmon, who went out and avenged their loss in the Big 12 tournament last year to the Iowa State Cyclones, beating them this year to secure the Big 12 tournament championship and are a number one seed in the NCAA tournament after losing Rory Harmon and being led by a true freshman, a dog at that, Mackenzie Booker. So no, I'm not going to talk about UConn. No, I'm not going to talk about Auburn. No, I'm not going to talk about Oregon. I'm going to talk about the Texas Longhorns women's basketball team because they remind me of a really good Nissan as well. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right. Hopefully Nissan don't get mad at me for that. And if they do, sorry. <laughs> Shout out Mackenzie Booker and Big Schaefer, though, for real. All right. My ninth question is, what does your rotation look like in the defensive backfield, right? We had a lot of rotations, you know, there last year. And I think we have a lot of talented players that need to see the field. I would expect your starting three corners are going to be John A. Barron, Terrence Brooks, and Malik Muhammad, which I'm fine with. But you also need to find ways to get Austin Jordan and Jalen Gilbo on the field, right? Gavin Holmes is still going to be a part of your corner rotation. And then you have true freshmen, Kobe Black, Wardell Mack, and Santana Wilson. Not sure if they're ready to get on the field, but they're certainly talented enough to do so so how do you you know manage that cornerback rotation this year and I think it's the same thing at safety right you know you got Derek Williams and Andrew Makuba you know I think they'll be your primary safeties but obviously Michael Tav uh, has earned the right to make plays on the field to get on the field and when he gets on the field he makes plays and then you have Warren Robertson and Jelani McDonald that can play that position as well and I would expect them to see you know, expect to see them get some playing time this season. So we know that we're going to rotate at that position, but what do the rotations look like? How many corners are you using? How many safeties are you using? How many talented DBs can you get on the field and not lose or suffer a loss in production? Who, who excuse me, is your starting left tackle in 2025, right? I don't think this is an oppressing question, obviously, because we got one of the best in the country in Kelvin Banks. But I do think that this is something you need to figure out right now, right, and have that you know, kind of development plan in place rather than Kelvin Banks moving on to the National Football League and then us saying, hmm, 
who's going to be our left tackle, right? I think you can start to figure that out right now. Whether it's going to be Brandon Baker, if he's going to move to the left side, I think he played right tackle in high school. I could be mistaken on that. Um, whether it's going to be Peyton Kirkland, um, whether there's somebody else that I'm not mentioning right now who may be in line for that left tackle spot, I'm not sure, right? But I think that in the last year of Kelvin Banks, you can use it sort of the way that, you know, we're using Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning, right? Another development year. Let somebody who is going to be your future left tackle, you know, possibly Brandon Baker, really soak up the game under Kelvin Banks and identify right now that that's going to be your left tackle of the future. Obviously, anything could happen in terms of bringing in the next, you know, true freshman class or transfer portal class. But I think it would be a good idea the way that we have Arch kind of waiting in the wings to have a player designated right now to be the next left tackle once Kelvin Banks moves on. I don't think this is something you should try to figure out next season. I think going into next season, you should already know who your next left tackle for the Texas Longhorns football team will be replacing a juggernaut at that position and Kelvin Banks. The next question I have is what is the best way to use Anthony Hill? Do you continue to use him off ball sideline to sideline as a pass rusher, as a utility player that can do everything on the field? Or do you move him to, into that on ball middle linebacker role that Jalen Ford played so well over the last two years, right? What is the best way to use Anthony Hill? Do you move him into Jalen Ford's role because Jalen Ford moved on? Or do you find somebody to play Jalen Ford's role and continue to use Anthony Hill as a chess piece like you did last year at a high level playing off ball. So I'm not sure the answer to that, right? I'm not smart enough to give you the answer to that, nor am I in the room or on the practice field with Anthony Hill and Pete Kukowski, right? So um, it's going to be interesting how they use him this season. I think regardless of how they use him, he's going to be a dog. Regardless of how they use him, he's still going to be an SEC defensive player of the year before he moves on to the National Football League, in my opinion. But I do think this offseason, you need to figure out what is the best way to use him. Do you just slap him into the Jalen Ford role and say, okay, you're the new Jalen Ford? Or do you continue to use him in an off-ball role? Is that the way to provide the most production from him at the 40 acres. We'll see this offseason and when the season starts. And then the last thing is who are the vocal leaders on this team, right? You don't have 11 players go to the um, NFL combine and you don't have a situation where seven, eight plus players can get drafted without losing veteran leadership or without losing leadership on this Texas football team. And we had so many veterans and seniors and super seniors and COVID seniors and retro teams on the Texas football team last year. That were one of the reasons we were one of the best teams in the country, but now, you know, they move on and not only do you have to replace that production, but you have to replace that leadership. Like you have to replace the leadership of a JT Sanders. You have to replace the leadership of an Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, a, a Tavondre Sweat, a, a, a Byron Murphy, a Jalen Ford. Uh, Jordan Winnington, the list goes on and on. So we know that Quinn Ewers has taken a step up in leadership. Uh, you know, I've seen Kelvin Banks, you know, has been more active in terms of his leadership. I'm sure there's, you know, players like Jade Barron, uh, you know, on the defensive side of the ball that are stepping up as leaders, Anthony Hill as well. Um, but who will be your vocal leaders on this football team? Who will be the ones um, that set the tone? you know, day in and day out, practice in and practice out, game in and game out, right? Like who will be the rah-rah guys on this team? Who will be the guys on this team that everybody wants to follow from the seniors to the juniors, to the sophomores, to the freshmen, to the transfers? Who are the guys on this team that everybody wants to get behind and go to war with? I think you have to figure that out this off season. We already have an idea of who a few of those players are, but the players know who they want to follow, right? We can't tell the players who they want to follow or who they should follow. The players know. And so I think we need to identify, we as in the team needs to identify who those vocal leaders and who the leaders of this football team will be going into the season, especially because you just lost so much leadership to the NFL draft. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked on Longhorns, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day, March Madness, spring practices, what a time. I didn't even mention Texas baseball and Texas softball. Literally, what a time of year. The best. Outside of football season, of course. I mean, come on now. All right, hook them. Peace.